So uh, I'd say a few words. Uh, uh, Vlad, uh, Vladimir Avnacharyan uh, graduated from um, Moscow University of Physics and Technology and then uh, did his uh, PhD in the US, working with the group of Michel de Varey. And then he uh, stayed as a postdoc in Harvard. And then uh, uh, already a number of years ago, um, I believe in 2014, Vlad, uh, you started a group in uh, University of Maryland, right? Yeah, that's correct. And uh, he's a pioneer of uh, uh, the uh, direction in superconducting quantum circuits, uh, which uh, uh, the main idea is having very high impedance and high frequency, which can be achieved with the so-called superinductance. And this is the topic of his lecture today. So we're very happy, very happy that Vlad is uh, actually with us uh, today and uh, is going to give this, uh, this lecture. Vlad, thanks. And uh, I see you sharing the screen, great. Right. Um, yeah, thanks, Alexei, again, for um, inviting me to the school. Um, I see there are quite a number of people uh, in the participants window, so welcome, everyone. Um, yeah, I'm going to use one, uh, one uh, device to show my head and then the other device to um, actually write. So I'm going to imitate uh, a blackboard talk like this. Um, so sorry for various possible technical issues. Um, so the topic of my talk yeah, is, is uh, high inductance superconducting qubits. And uh, my plan was uh, not really to show you slides because um, I already did show some slides um, during the conference. And so here I will just um, kind of give you an introduction to superconducting qubits. And to really introduce high inductance superconducting qubits, I have to discuss a little bit uh, the qubits that are oh, not high inductance. You can say maybe low inductance. <laughs> what does it even mean? Um, well, I thought a little bit about this and I think really what we have in mind is that um, there has been a certain evolution of superconducting circuits that act as qubits. And I think the one that um, worked well at first was the Cooper per box, and then it evolved into a transmon. And then with the introduction of this high value compact inductors, superinductors, um, the two new types of qubits appeared. So one of them is, um, I think is quite um, well known right now, it's called fluxonium. And then there is a more recent one um, uh, by our group that's called Blochnium. And um, I will, I won't really tell you today how to build a quantum computer, but I will try to introduce some basic physics of this qubits. Um, in fact, um, I will try to argue that um, if you think of superconducting qubits as uh, atoms in a periodic table, you know, the most elementary circuits, um, but different ones with different quantum mechanical properties. Uh, I think these four actually form the periodic table, meaning that uh, they cover all possible physical regimes of um, quantum dynamics of the simplest Josephson circuit. Of course, as you couple more and more circuits, you're going to create even more uh, complicated quantum dynamics. And the analogy of this is that you will have uh, you will have molecules and uh, even more uh, complex uh, <laughs> chemistry of superconducting circuits. And um, and some of this is already happening, but the elementary one um, are these, and at least in my opinion. And so I'm so I'm uh, I will even write down sort of a periodic. Uh, periodic uh, table of uh, superconducting uh, artificial atoms. Right, and um, during this 
lecture, you're welcome to interrupt me really at any time and um, ask whatever questions you have. We can have a discussion. I think we have plenty of time. Uh, Vlad, just to inform you, so uh, the uh, audience will ask questions uh, in the chat. And uh, I will watch the chat, and uh, if uh, I see something which can be answered, I will interrupt you. Otherwise, you are welcome also to answer questions in the chat directly. Ah, uh, okay, okay. So let me see if I see the chat then. Uh, let's see. Oh, here's chat. Okay, got it. Yeah, yeah okay, good. So uh, I'll, I'll keep an eye on the chat. <laughs> thanks. Okay, thanks. All right. So. Um, yeah. So let's um, let's start. Um, let, let me start by discussing um, this um, um, Cooper uh, pair box um, uh, qubit. Uh, it's also called uh, charge qubit uh, because I think it's a good um, starting point um, um, yeah, for, for this discussion. So, um, so imagine imagine a small island, um, superconducting grain, and um, so strictly speaking, charge on this grain. If it's completely isolated, you can imagine there's um, somewhere over here. There's a ground, call it ground. Um, So, so as long as the superconducting grain is isolated from, from the ground, the charge on this grain um, should be quantized, meaning that, well, just because the charge comes from electrons and electron charge is quantized, if it's a superconducting grain, then the charge will be quantized in units of 2e. And so, and so it's going to be safe to assume that at any time uh, there is a charge um, um, you know, the charge on this grain Q is going to be 2e times n, where n is an integer. And um, the other thing to note is that as you add, uh, let's, let's assume that we started with the case of n equals zero, uh, Cooper pair. Um, so let's maybe write down, um, because I don't know your background, I'm going to make some comments which are a little bit trivial. So this 2e is a charge of a Cooper pair, a Cooper pair charge. Um, so the energy associated with this charge, and this is just high school physics, um, uh, is going to be given by, um, 2en squared divided by 2c, where c is the capacitance of this grain. Um, of the grain. Well, uh, you probably, you know, what is the capacitance, right? Capacitance is just um, a property, just an electrostatic capacitance. It's a, it's some characteristic of a, of um, of a metal piece that, as you add charge to it, that charge creates electric field, and that electric field creates energy, and um, the this energy is going to be quadratic in the charge, and um, and the, you know the conversion from energy to charge is this capacitance. Uh, how large, uh, so I think in the 90s, the, the first sort of important observation is that, is that surprisingly, it's quite easy to make a grain such that um, adding an extra Cooper pair, only two electrons, makes a difference in energy. So let me tell you a little bit about capacitances. Um, well, if you consider... So basically, how um, uh, what's the charging? How large? How large can the charging energy be? Um, well, for that we need to understand what's the typical grain capacitance. 
So the rule of thumb that is very easy to remember is that if you, um, I mean, again, it's not maybe, um, maybe obvious, but I think you can, you can look it up after my lecture. So imagine you take a straight piece of wire. I'm, I'm doing it for a wire because then the calculation is quite easy. So then, um, and suppose there's a, there's a ground, but somewhere very far, actually it doesn't really matter where, where the ground is. Um, so it turns out that the capacitance um, of this wire to ground, so you see if I can kind of chop it into, into small, um, you know, into small little pieces of, uh, Length uh, the L. So then the, the 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 one thing that's easy to remember is that C is approximately equals to epsilon zero, kind of um, uh, times uh, the L, where epsilon zero is vacuum uh, permittivity. So uh, now a good uh, test for you is to ask if you remember what is epsilon zero. So um, if you never dealt with uh, capacitance calculations, you probably don't. But um, epsilon zero is approximately 10 picofarad per meter. You see it as units of capacitance per unit length. That's another thing that uh, students usually don't know. Um, so, okay, 10 picofarads per meter, we're typically dealing with islands of about uh, micron size. So we can say that this is um, 10 um, femtofarad per micron meter. Um, and so um, to, to, to calculate, um, Oh, actually, I'm sorry. Um, it's actually supposed to be, uh, just one second, I think it's uh, 10 picofarad uh, yes, per meter and um, uh, pico, right, and femto per, per micrometer. Um, and so if you calculate the typical energy associated with um, a few femtofarad um, capacitance, um, you will see that um, um, well, I mean, let, let, let's do the math, right? So, so we can we can uh, let let's convert it into something. So we take um, we take e square over two c, so that would be ten to the minus nineteen, ten to the minus nineteen. And here we're going to get uh, 10 to the minus um, 15. And um, let's say we also will divide it by, um, let's do it in temperature, one hour KV. And so here we're going to get uh, 10 to the minus 23. So if we do the numbers, um, uh, you see what happens is that uh, I get 19, 19 on top, and then 15 is in N23 is basically like 19 and 19. So I'm going to get one. And so you see um, that um, that one femtofarad of capacitance uh, translates into one Kelvin of charging energy. So what it means is that in order to, um, in order to add um, one electron to a typical micron size island, I need, a, I need an energy of about one Kelvin. And what that means is that if I cool down um, these devices below one Kelvin, then that charge wouldn't really come spontaneously. It's gonna stay there and at least an experimentalist will insist that this charge can, can go in. And so this is sort of one um, sort of first, um, first example that, okay, so, so charging effects, charging effects, uh, means uh, uh, temperature must be much less than one Kelvin. And um, we typically work uh, uh, in this field at about uh, 10 millik uh, base temperature.
Um, let's see. Oh, I see that um, Ilya Bisedian corrects me that this is um, out of arts. That's right. So let's put out of arts. That's, um, I think it's correct. Yeah. And um, I still put a femtofarad because we, um, um, you know, uh, what happens is that uh, let's, uh, let's maybe correct uh, correction. Another another correction. Uh, maybe a remark. Um, If this wire lands on silicon, um, then epsilon goes into epsilon zero epsilon, and this epsilon is about ten uh, for silicon or uh, sapphire, our typical substrates. And so, um, so 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 you see, so um, ten out of farad uh, per uh, micrometer in vacuum translates into 100 out of hour per micrometer uh, on a substrate. And so, um, and so, yeah, so this is why, so this is why one femtofar, femtofar is, you know, why, why I chose that capacitance as a typical easy to fabricate grain, because then we're talking about, um, so one uh, femtofar is a, is a capacitance. Of uh, relatively uh, large uh, gray. Okay, thanks a lot. So you see, it's um, it's a lot easier with comments. You can correct what I'm saying <laughs> in real time. Um, right, and this is where cryogenic temperatures enter first. So so we get these grains, um, um, and we need to think. Okay, does it have um, does it have a billion or a billion plus one uh, Cooper pairs in it? So um, next, uh, let's um, let's introduce some some weak um, some weak Josephson coupling. Josephson coupling. So this is still a superconducting grain, and this is a ground superconducting ground. And so now we allow n to change. And the way we usually do this is we say, well, um, let's uh, you know, let's allow Cooper pairs to tunnel. And one way to, um, so what what will that lead to is that uh, the uh, n is no longer conserved. N is no longer conserved. Um, so it can fluctuate. And uh, this draws some coupling. We typically introduce like a term like this, right? We say that um, if we if we introduce um, uh, if we introduce uh, an operator oh, um, sorry. as um, if we introduce an operator as um, kind of a sum like this. So we introduce um, such that you see if I uh, if I apply n to a um, state, uh, so this will be a state with uh, n um, charges on the island. Um, then uh, it's just going to be an eigenstate um, going to the n times n. Um, so the Josephson the Josephson effect uh, will look like um, a term that takes n and changes to n plus one, and then of course we have to make it symmetric, so it can take n plus one and change it to n, and uh, then we'd better sum it over all possible n. And there's an amplitude for this effect, which uh, is exactly uh, what we call Josephson energy. And uh, I think for consistency, we have to divide it by two. Okay, 
And so you see, so now uh, we have the Josephson effect and then we have the charging uh, that we can write as, um, as a 2E um, N square over 2C. So, um, and so now, um, so now the, the the charge fluctuates, and in fact, as you increase this Josephson energy term, um, you see we can maybe write this like this. We can say it's a four E C times uh, m squared, uh, where uh, E C is defined as E square over two C. It's a bit. Um, Mm, historical definition that we deal with Cooper pairs, but we still define this EC charging energies as a one E square over two C, and hence there's a four in the definition of energy. It sometimes drives um, 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 a theory students um, a bit crazy, and I see there's a, um, there's a question that a Cooper pair charge equals to two E, so the tunnel operator will have to the form n n plus two. So um, so n uh, let me let me uh, comment uh, here. So n is a state with um, n Cooper pairs. So hence the tunneling um, changes n into n plus one because one pair tunnels. So one pair is two electrons. And um, the only remnant that uh, some a you know, long time ago before superconductivity there was only one electron is this definition of EC where there is only E square over two C. But then in the charging energy, um, we we still get this four. So so leave with that. Um, just uh, I guess you'll get used to it that the charging energy is four EC times n squared. Um, okay. <laughs> Uh, and it's quite important because you see, uh, if you mix up the definitions, you make a mistake in the charging energy by a factor of four, which can have a huge effect on the spectrum of, of the qubit. So this is why um, this is um, yeah, this is why I'm pointing this out. So and so because n fluctuates. Um, there has to be some other variable that uh, if n fluctuates a lot, will there has to be some other variable that will become well defined, and this variable is superconducting phase. Superconducting phase. Uh, so superconducting phase is some variable that can be attributed to. Um, an island that is strongly coupled to um, to uh, a larger superconducting island, and the meaning of this phase, um, so um, let's call it phase phi. Um, you can uh, convince yourself that um, you can come up with an operator e to the i phi. Um, you will see that when you deal with superconducting phase, it's it's in some cases it's important that the operator is um, basically that phi is a basically the operator is a periodic function of this phase, and so you can imagine introducing operator e to the i phi such that um, it takes um, it takes n and turns it into n plus one. And then uh, e to the minus i phi is going to take n and turn it into n minus one. And as you see, I've already written up on um, this operator. It's um, so so you can um, so you can uh, you can write that uh, the sum of um, n uh, n plus one plus n plus one n over two is actually. Uh, is an operator associated with a different variable called cosine phi. And you see in many respects, um, phi and n are um, um, conjugate quantum mechanically. Um, because you see, uh, if you take, um, if you take, uh, um, like let's compare them to um, 
if, if you take a ring, um, a ring, you will get um, angle. You, you can measure the position of a particle on the ring um, with an angle. And so then um, N has the meaning of angular momentum. So N is kind of like angular momentum. And then phi is like angle. So that's the, that's the analogy. Um, and um, and you can you can imagine the commutation relation between these operators is that um, well um, if you have um, n e to the i phi and e to the minus i phi, so that would be n. Now someone has to help me. It's either plus one or minus one. So I'm gonna write plus one, and I'm gonna put a I'll put here a question mark for you to figure out. Okay, whoever figures out, let me know. So you see, I mean, the point is that uh, you cannot uh, swap uh, e to the i phi and n because if you if you could, uh, then um, then e to the minus i phi would cancel e to the i phi, and then and then uh, you know you you will just get n, but instead you get n plus one. So you see, phi and n uh, do not do not commute, and. Um, and uh, it's this non-commutativity is basically uh, leads to the fact that there is some quantum dynamics uh, when uh, when n is, um, is 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 well defined doesn't fluctuate very close to an integer then phi has to be kind of spread out and fluctuate by a lot um, and spread out um, on a circle um, and when um, the phi is well defined then um, n will have to fluctuate by a lot uh, which will bring me um, and 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 you see um, n will fluctuate by a lot when there's a strong link between between um, um, between the uh, between the island and um, um, and the ground um, and uh, sometimes we say that phase coherence establishes between um, Two pieces of superconductor, meaning that their phase uh, difference between the island and the ground becomes well defined. Um, so let's uh, try to first. Um, so you see, it seems that there are two energy scales, uh, Ej and Ec. Um, so one can say that um, for. Um, for EJ much bigger than EC. Uh, sorry, uh, hold on. Let's do it. Um, for EJ much smaller than EC, we say that um, uh, fluctuations of N is much less than one, and fluctuations of phi is comparable to, uh, to pi. And then there's the opposite regime where. Um, and by fluctuations, well, we'll see what I mean. Um, basically, um, standard, uh, standard, uh, you know, root mean square of the um, of the ground state uh, value. And then for um, for EJ um, much bigger than EC, we get the opposite regime. We get that um, that now charge uh, fluctuates by uh, a lot more than one. Um, Pair and and uh, the phase is um, is stable and you can just say that it's much less than one you know, in units of radians. So um, and so let's examine these two regimes in a little bit more detail. So let's start with the regime where a charge is stable. So there are there are several ways to look at this. Um, so one is uh, is to use the analogy on um, of this uh, particle on a ring. So you see, we can uh, we can say that you know the Hamiltonian is uh, for um, E C uh, n squared um, um, minus uh, E J cosine phi and um, yeah, you can think of a particle on a ring. Um, you can also um, 
but you see, in order to model cosine phi, we need to introduce some kind of potential, right? Because this term basically says that um, uh, the particle prefers the phi to be closer to zero than closer to pi because uh, because of this uh, cosine term, and that uh, just um, corresponds to a pendulum. So uh, it's actually like a pendulum, pendulum term, pendulum potential energy. Um, well, um, so how do we how do we how do we solve this? Well, um, you, you see that um, whatever happens to phi, the potential energy can can never be bigger than plus minus e j. So, which means that for sufficiently large e c, you can just ignore the potential term, and uh, hence um, the um, you see. Uh, the energy will be just um, so for uh, you see much bigger than EJ, you just get um, you just get that uh, you have a free particle. Essentially, it, it can rotate. Uh, it has so much angular momentum that it doesn't really care that there is a bit of a bump uh, on the way that uh, that gives preference to uh, zero phase versus non-zero phase. Um, so if you put so if you put a charge of um, of um, of one, your energy will, uh, so, so essentially see if you look at the spectrum, right? Uh, you see the spectrum will be um, well the energy, right? So we're going to get uh, uh, the lowest two states corresponding to n equals one, and then um, and then uh, you see this is a zero uh, so you see so that would be uh, for EC and then when n equals two we're going to get um, we're going to get uh, states uh, here so uh, let's say plus minus one plus minus two uh, and then of course uh, this um, This would be um, four times four EC, and this is a spectrum of um, of a two D rotor, two D uh, rotor. I think uh, I think that's how it's called. Uh, so one thing I wanted to point out is that you see it's a very unharmonic spectrum. Um, it's uh, so so you get degeneracy um, and um, you get double degeneracy. And, um, so uh, let's uh, write down. So comment uh, degeneracy, uh, and uh, and there is a strong uh, unharmonicity. Well, I guess maybe to see how strong it is, we, we need to um, we need to um, no no it's okay so 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 this ground state is basically n equals zero. Let me point this out. Um, so you see we go uh, from um, so 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 if we encode qubit into states n equals zero and n equals to one, we get uh, some qubit energy, and then the transition from state one to state two is going to cost uh, three times that energy. So that's uh, considered quite um, a strong in harmonicity, and that's a that's a big advantage. Um, now let's come. Now let's um, let me tell you that this degeneracy is quite easy to break. Um, so um, and that's important. Um, because it makes the charge qubit not such a good qubit. So the generosity is easy to break because um, you see, um, you have to imagine again the island, the ground, and there's some electric field between. You can just apply this electric field external, external. Electric field, 
And this external electric field will, what will it do? Well, it will essentially offset a little bit more charge here. Um, let's see, field going this way. So yeah, I think it, I guess it should be negative. So it's negative. And so um, there's this con concept of offset charge, offset charge. So the, the charging energy is going to be, so what was 2En square over to C is now going to be basically 2En minus N, um, let me call it, um, uh, let me call it G, I'll explain why, why, why it's called G uh, square over to C. So essentially the way you can think of this electric field is if you just take um, oops, if you just take a voltage source, um, DC voltage source, and use some capacitance. So you see that would offset um, that would offset um, uh, usually we call this capacitance CG and this voltage source VG you know by gating this, this analogy from field effect and transistors and so then the meaning of NG is just uh, VG times uh, CG divided by 2E so it's an offset charge and so you see as a function of this offset charge. Um, and G, the energy of our, you know, the spectrum on, of our qubit and this large charging energy regime would just be this parabola like this. So for example, if I set this parabola to n equals zero, then this will be n equals one, n equals two, and then uh, this will be um, n equals minus one. And so then likewise NG, so this would be zero, and this would be one, this would be two, this would be minus one. And then you see the first time parabolas cross is when NG is uh, one half. Um, and that's, that's the only spot where the generacy is uh, preserved everywhere else, the energy depends on the offset charge. So what does it mean? It means that the, the, the energy of the qubit transition, so for example, if we bias somewhere over here, oops. Qubit transition. It depends on the offset charge. And it turns out that the offset charge is really hard to, to, um, to keep stable. It just, um, there are so many sources of random electric field in superconducting circuits that, um, that basically um, it, it, it increases the, the qubit time, you know, the coherence time, uh, reduces the coherence time to just some impractical values. Um, so qubit transition sensitive to NG and background noise in NG is too high, period. Um, now, um, now we need to bring back the Josephson term and you see what the Josephson term does, um, as, as I wrote down earlier, right? Uh, okay, it's um, you can think of it as a cost time, but you can also think of it as this um, as this um, um, coupling of states with different n. And you see, coupling of states with different n is is nothing else but a little um, anti-crossing. Um, so let's see if we can erase just a little bit. Uh, like this, and um, let's also raise this thing. 
and then we will take um, we'll get um, we'll get a ground state which goes like this, and we get excited states which go like that. And so most um, good charge qubits they have been operated in this regime where op optimal optimal is called sweet spot sweet spot where uh, the transition frequency is insensitive to this ng at least to first order and that stabilizes the qubit although not very you know um, it's still 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 the kind of coherence times were typically limited to about uh, uh, about few hundred nanoseconds. So um, let me put this down. It's important. So even even at sweet spot, the fluctuation of frequency, the delta omega zero one. So it's used to what's called is zero. And it's called is one. Omega zero one approximately scaled as one over 100 nanoseconds. And so people thought, well, what if you keep uh, increasing the Josephson energy, right? So then you can uh, keep uh, uh, increasing the splitting and hence the curvature of the of the qubit energy versus this offset charge will, will become flatter and flatter. And so um, what people have done is, uh, and, so, and so another way to think about this is, well, uh, let's draw now the Josephson energy. So, uh, so, so the, the transmon idea was um, uh, let's uh, increase EJ, right? Let's make uh, EJ much bigger than EC. And then you can think of the system, um, um, I mean, you can, you, you, can, you can think in terms, of, in terms of hopping and essentially what happens is that now not only N can hop into plus minus one, but, uh, also, this parabola uh, zero will be coupled to two and to, to basically all of them. So it's called sort of strong, uh, uh, I guess, if you know crystals, it's going to be called uh, kind of uh, the opposite of tight binding model. Um, but the way we like to think about this is if we plot uh, the potential energy as a function of phase, we get this Josephson potential cosine phi, and I'm going to plot it. Um, from uh, between pi and minus pi. And so what happens is that if the potential energy is very large, then, um, then, uh, then my, um, my pendulum will be kind of uh, stuck at an angle close, um, close to zero. So in my, uh, my pendulum analogy, um, uh, the large Josephson energy is a little bit like a placing a pendulum in a very high gravity field. And so then, um, and then the pendulum will be kind of stuck down and maybe phase will fluctuate a little bit. So you see, we're naturally entering the opposite regime where now um, phase um, uh, is stuck to zero just because of the large, um, larger force on it. Um, and well, um, it can still fluctuate, and these fluctuations will correspond to vibrations in this uh, Josephson potential well near the bottom. And these vibrations um, will have a spectrum that uh, you can actually guess um, from completely classical considerations. Um, it will be just vibrations of the corresponding pendulum. So, um, so to figure this out, we need to let's uh, maybe copy paste our our Hamiltonian. Uh, this one. Um, so paste it here. Um, so you see, we need to come up with an energy scale, um, and we have EC and EJ. So this will be zero, one, two. 
and the way to do this is, is, is to say that you know cosine phi can be um, can be um, approximated as um, as one minus uh, phi square over two, um, and then and then we have uh, you see then we have h uh, of an approximate harmonic oscillator e c n square minus uh, e j phi square over two. And uh, I think you can check that omega zero one times h bar will be equal to exactly eight e j e c under square root. That makes sense, right? We need to make a combination out of e j and e c. We know that it's nothing fancy, so uh, so uh, the simplest way is to put the, take the product and put it under square root. And it makes sense because as we make EJ larger, the potential well grows. And so hence, um, hence the, the levels are more spread out. And the same thing with the charging energy because it's a little bit like a, like a mass. So, um, uh, so you see, um, uh, so you can compare. So you compare uh, that, uh, what is it? Uh, period of a pendulum. Uh, is what is a uh, square root of uh, so uh, the longer the pendulum, the longer the period L over G, right? Uh, for pendulum. Right. And so um, so this so so this regime um, you see again phase is 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 localized because the strong Jodison coupling if you look at it sort of from this cosine viewpoint, just doesn't like when phi is anything different than zero. If you look at it from the charging viewpoint, you see that well, because charge tunnels, um, because Josephson term kind of causes the strong tunneling of Cooper pairs and becomes um, becomes um, basically the, 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 the root mean square fluctuation of n becomes bigger than one. Uh, and that, according to the Heisenberg principle, requires phi to be to be localized. So that's what happens, and that comes at a price. Uh, that uh, so, so okay. So so now um, okay. So now let's see what happens with the with the offset charge. And this is quite um, quite an amusing um, part. So let me uh, introduce here offset charge, and g g charge. Sometimes we call it. Um, so you see, uh, uh, we get some intuition that when Joseph's energy is strong, then the, the charge offset should not affect the spectrum. And we get gain this intuition by considering this anti crossings of the parabolas, right? So as we make the Josephson energy larger and larger, I mean, essentially what happens is that we, uh, we're, getting, um, we're getting spectra like this. this, and then here we're going to get something like that. Et cetera, et cetera. So um, um, it's, it's kind of interesting to try to figure it out from just from this equation. So what happens um, is that when we solve for this Hamiltonian, it's not enough to just know the values of EC and EJ. You need to know the boundary condition, and the boundary condition uh, here is, you know, because it's um, because well, phase is periodic. You you need to say that um, um, boundary condition that uh, psi of phi equals to psi of uh, phi plus uh, two pi. Right. Otherwise, we have a have a problem because because you know this point is actually kind of like connected to this one in some sense, and um, it turns out that this boundary condition is what makes the spectrum sensitive to ng. Um, why is it the case? Well, it's because you can um, you can you can apply a transformation. Right. Remember, I told you that a phi operator shifts n by, um, like you see, if each of the i phi uh, causes n to go into n plus one, 
then e to the i phi times uh, ng is going to cause n goes into uh, n plus ng. And if you apply this transformation, um, you will, you see, get rid of ng from the Hamiltonian. Um, so you see, so what you can do is you can apply a transformation u uh, like this, um, and it's called a gauge transformation. And um, what this transformation will do, it will, it will, all, it will, it will change the Hamiltonian into just um, four e c n square minus e j cosine phi. Um, and um, but it will also make the boundary condition into psi of phi is now e to the i two pi and g times psi of um, pi plus two pi. And because of that, the spectrum will depend on depend on ng unless can anyone tell me um, under what uh, in, in what situation this boundary condition will still be um, independent on uh, Ng, so you see we go we go a full circle, and we need to acquire some phase uh, given by Ng, but there is a uh, one quite common situation where Ng is um, irrelevant. Um, well, um, you see, um, uh, let's let's imagine the wave function right uh, in this uh, transmon regime. So we have a potential energy like this phi. So this is um, pi. This is a minus pi. So let's imagine a ground state wave function when when um, when um, j is much larger than e c. Well, uh, we know it's a vibration, right? So the wave function will be localized like this. And so you see, it's uh, very close to zero, both at pi and minus pi, which means that, uh, uh, which means that uh, if this is zero here and zero here, then we don't care about uh, the, the gate charge. And that's the, 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 the same the same is true for the for the for the for the next excited state, right? Its wave function will be also you know have tails that uh, almost decayed by the time you went um, under the barrier. And hence you don't know about this boundary condition. And because of that, you don't really know about the offset charge. So this is the mathematics of um, of um, a charge qubit turning into a transmon that that as you localize the phase around zero, um, the system becomes insensitive to offset charge. Uh, in fact, this insensitivity is exponential because the tails under the barrier are exponentially suppressed. And um, physically what happens is that, well, um, you can say that um, charge is fluctuating so much that adding an offset to it doesn't make a difference, okay? And so what we've gained, so, so what we've gained with the transmon, um, uh, so you see, so, so transmon is that uh, uh, no uh, offset charge sensitivity um, but the spectrum is, um, is almost a harmonic oscillator. But you see the qubit uh, went into, uh, well, I'm gonna say almost because uh, it makes a big difference. It's still a very good qubit. Um, because, um, because you see we get, um, we get um, so if the, if the Josephson energy was, um, was, um, was parabolic, you see, it will be phi squared, and this is a cos phi. So we get uh, what happens is that we get the first two states zero and one, 
a little um, further um, from each other than one from two. So you see the spectrum looks like this. So E2 uh, minus E1 is less than E1 minus E0. And uh, their difference, um, so you should um, take it as an exercise. Uh, exercise uh, proof proof um, that um, E2 minus E1 minus E1 minus E0 is approximately given by exactly EC. Um, and so you see, we have the situation that um, uh, omega zero one, h bar omega zero one is um, uh, square root of eight ej over ec. And then we also have a condition that, uh, and this is of course approximate uh, because it's in the limit when j is much bigger than ec. So we need this condition. And from that, you see that necessarily h bar omega zero one is much less than ec. So this is what means uh, weak unharmonicity. So the way you prove this is, is you just need to expand the uh, you know, cosine phi into one minus phi square over two plus phi to the four or 24 and do the perturbation theory. Uh, perturbation. Right, and so um, um, so this is where I can um, I can now talk about um, uh, high inductance qubits because you see it's kind of uh, um, it seems to be that uh, there's this fundamental um, trade-off is that either you get a qubit which is really a qubit you have you know two well isolated states the higher states are somewhere far away but it's sensitive to charge noise and uh, unfortunately for for kind of technical reasons the way these junctions are made um a charge noise is is has a quite a large background that kind of makes this qubit not so interesting um, or you go into the transmod regime where you let the, 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 the charge on an island to fluctuate by a lot, and then you get um, a qubits that are insensitive to this background charge noise, but you get, um, uh, you get a weak harmonicity. And weak harmonicity is, 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 is kind of, is, is, not, is really not great for quantum computing because you know that if you take two harmonic oscillators, well, they don't really interact. They can hybridize, but if you go into you know, a different uh, frame of reference, you'll see that it's just still two non-interacting harmonic oscillators. So you cannot do quantum logical operations on them. Um, in, um, sometimes I think in quantum mechanics, they teach us that Hamiltonians with quadratic actions are not even quantum, strictly speaking, because you can, you can describe their response using uh, classical mechanics. Um, so um, that's that's another way to see why weak harmonicity is, um, is 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 problematic. So basically, the weaker it is, the more challenges you have in in designing logic. And so there is this kind of strong motivation to see well what else like what other circuits you can build that will um, will not be sensitive to charge offsets and yet will have um, a strong unharmonicity. And so um, the the so now we're going to talk about this idea of um, of Luxonium, where we again start with this with the situation that we have a grade, we have a ground, and you see we 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 want um, so our considerations are like this. So we want to keep EC. Uh, so if EC is much less than EJ, then we get a weak unharmonicity. No matter what. So uh, EC much bigger than EJ, we get charge noise. And so to go, um, so to go around, um, the idea is, well, what if we connect this island to ground? Oops. 
with something that has a um, zero, um, that's basically a superconductor in the zero frequency limit, such that if you apply electric field, it will short circuit uh, any kind of offset charge. Like if you try to offset a charge here, it will just kind of leak down and that's it. So, um, and at the same time, you have the Josephson tunnel. And schematically, the, 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 the idea is that, well, you have this uh, island with a capacitance, you have the Josephson junction, and then you add an inductance, L. Um, and so now, um, if we, if we uh, consider um, the phase, um, um, we consider how the Hamiltonian changes, we'll have to say that now we have four EC n minus ng square minus ej cosine phi and plus uh, we're going to have a term that is quadratic in phi, that's the energy of the inductancy L phi square over two. Um, and so <laughs> And so this EL is basically has uh, the meaning as follows. So, so when we have a phase across the Josephson junction, that also imposes a phase across the inductance because uh, there's a loop. Um, and so then, If, if you have a phase um, across the inductance, the energy will go as um, phi times h bar over two e squared over two l, right? So, so that's the energy of the induct of an inductance energy, an inductance charged with flux h bar over to e times phi. Um, and um, so you see now, instead of just cosine phi, we also get a quadratic term in phi. And that actually, um, uh, so, so, so let's try to see what it does. Um, so, so now we can keep uh, we can keep a situation where let's say um, uh, EJ is uh, comparable to EC. So we, um, and, and intuitively this inductance no longer should make the spectrum no longer sensitive to the offset charges. Um, how can we see it from the Hamiltonian quantum, quantum mechanically? Well, um, let's imagine the potential and the potential is gonna look like this, right? Uh, it's going to be, um, so we have a, a cosine and then we have a parabola. And so now we need to add them, right? And so if parabola is very steep, so basically when EL is much larger than EJ, you can imagine that the cosine, you know, this, Kind of you know periodic thing will just get stretched and and then uh, you know it will just be this. In some sense, you can neglect the. Um, however, if um, EL is much less than EJ, uh, you will get something like this. And this is phi. And importantly, again, this is zero, two pi, uh, four pi, minus two pi, minus four pi. So what happens here is that um, all of a sudden I can no longer define my wave functions as uh, something living on a circle. So this is not, a pendulum. 
uh, phi is defined, uh, let's use the calculus term, phi belongs to a real axis. So, um, in fact, my boundary condition for phi is that, like, if I if I if I try to consider the ground state, let's say something localized in this well, I will still get some kind of a wave function, right? That is localized here, but now its tail can go all the way to two pi, four pi, etc. And I know just from common sense that well, this potential um, localizes anything, so. So, so the real boundary condition should be that the modulus of psi um, of uh, plus minus infinity uh, is zero. And you see, because now the boundary condition is only on the modulus of the wave function, there is no phase. And hence, um, there is really zero sensitivity to this, um, to this offset charge. Um, So that's um, that's the mathematical description of an inductive shunt. So why um, why do we call this um, um, a large inductance qubits? Well, because you see, you need to make El much less than Ej, and um, that means that L has to be you know quite large. And um, I will say in a minute um, how large does it need to be, but let's for now um, um, review the spectrum of this um, of this uh, system. So the fact that there is no sensitivity to offset charge uh, no longer requires me to consider states that are um, um, that are that are localized at the bottom of this Josephson potential. So you see, what I can do is I can consider states that um, such that I have a state kind of very close to the to the top of the first well, second well, third well, and then of course, you know these are semi-classical states, but but in practice they will all get hybridized, and they will be like this. And uh, there's no reason for this spectrum to be harmonic. It's um, you know, not harmonic anymore, just because the potential doesn't really look like a parabola at all. Um, in particular, there is a, there's a special situation when we apply external flux through the loop that equals to, um, um, that equals to, to pi, so let's apply external flux, phi external equals to pi. So then, um, then you see, I'm gonna have to take this phi and say phi minus pi, because you see if, if, uh, if phase across the inductance is phi, then across the junction has to be phi minus pi or vice versa. And that uh, changes this bump um, into a double well. And so you see then, the potential will look more like this. So this is at phi external equals pi. So basically half of flux quantum in the loop. Um, and so and so then if if I adjust now EC and EJ accordingly, basically make EC not too small, I can actually have the first two states that look like this. Zero, one. So they correspond to tunneling across this barrier. Um, but then the higher state could really correspond to more like an orbital. In fact, actually, if I if I um, if I'm even more if I'm even more clever, I can uh, pick up uh, parameters such that. And by the way, you can just plot that potential on your computers and and see yourself how it works. Uh, you can actually do something like this. Um, And then um, you see, then um, then you get this uh, the qubit states uh, really well isolated.
and there is no charge noise. <laughs> So, um, so that's uh, that's the idea of um, behind the uh, flux conjoint qubit. And uh, by then you can play various tricks. Uh, so um, what's nice is that this transition frequency is given by tunneling, and as a result, you can really tune it in a quite a broad frequency range. So, for example, if you usually um, uh, transmonds. Um, you see they operate at five gigahertz um, for various, I mean, it's actually very next to impossible to make a, a different frequency flux on using at least conventional junctions, because if you make the frequency too high, it's very hard to measure uh, and it's going to be, tends to be kind of suffer from Bruce effect. And to make it too low is going to be sensitive to charge noise because low transmit frequency means um, you have a small ratio of EJ over EC. But in fluxoniums, um, uh, you can make this. Uh, you, you you can you can make it as low as let's say hundred megahertz, and um, and this is becomes uh, this way really a different type of qubit because the frequency is low, and um, um, well. Um, uh, and so all the tricks that you play with it are a little different, and if you play them right, you can you can turn them um, to your advantage. Um, so, so yeah, so you see. So I hope I've convinced you that um, by doing this um, inductive shunt um, with the appropriate uh, uh, you know values of inductance, basically sufficiently large one, you can create a very nonlinear potential. And you get going to get a very unharmonic qubit that doesn't suffer from charge noise. Um, um, if you make this inductance even larger, you can go um, you can go to even more interesting regime. But um, before I go there, let me give you um, uh, sort of another way of thinking about fluxonium, um, which is maybe related uh, to some experiments on face slips. You see, the way you can think of fluxonium is that um, like this spectrum here um, is actually bears some similarity to that of a charge qubit. Um, the way you do this is um, if you just consider the circuit as a loop with one weak link, You can you can think of the of the loop as a, something that has an energy of uh, El uh, um, phi like this, and one half is again is is just uh, let, me, let me write it one half over here to be consistent. And then this tunneling between the two wells, you see, you can say that it's a process that um, that um, changes phi to um, to plus minus to five plus minus two pi. So you see, if I if I treat phi. Um, at the same time, phi, if I only look at the low energy states, phi tends to be localized either in one well or the other well. So it's kind of tempting to say that phi is um, something like um, an integer operator, let's say two pi times m. And, um, and then um, what, I, what I add here is going to be something that looks like um, a sum over, um, m, m plus one, plus m plus one, m. And there will be some amplitude here, which is usually called ES. And ES is uh, usually called a phase slip amplitude. And so what you do is, um, is you, um, you say that well, the tunneling in this in this double well potential is a little bit like having a loop, 
and and um, and flux in this loop can tunnel back and forth by sort of some analogy with the way a Cooper pair tunnels on an island back and forth. And so as a result, you will get a spectrum as a function of phi external, which also consists of parabolas. But now these parabolas are given by, um, by the inductive term. And they will be split by the tunneling like that. And so this will be state zero and this will be state one. Um, so, so you see uh, there's a kind of duality with the charge qubit, uh, except that now um, the spectrum is nonlinear, but it's is sensitive to flux noise. And this is where we, again, we'll look at the um, technological situation. And it turns out that background flux noise is much better, much lower than background charge, uh, charge noise. And so what happens is that having some sensitivity to, um, to this uh, flux noise basically doesn't, uh, doesn't really limit the coherence of these qubits, even at the level of milliseconds. So essentially, you can tolerate that your qubit is a little bit is is, is flux sensitive um, if you operate it at this um, at this sweet spot. Um, now this uh, this uh, this analogy with the hopping of uh, flux and hopping of charge breaks down when you consider higher states because at high energies, uh, yeah, fluxonium you know cannot really be described as a as a some kind of a dual relationship to a Cooper pair box. But if you consider on the low energy states for some parameters, uh, it's actually very helpful because you see you get this kind of duality. So you get um, you get um, you get a charge qubit. So you get um, Cooper pair hopping, and then you get fluxonium. Uh, and here you get um, you get flux. Uh, flux quantum uh, hopping. So you see Cooper pair hopping, you get charge noise, flux quantum hopping, you get flux noise. Flux noise is much smaller than charge noise, hence uh, fluxonium is a much more useful qubit than a Cooper, a Cooper, pair, uh, Cooper pair box. So then uh, you take a, uh, then you take um, a charge qubit, um, pick some color uh, and you turn it into a transmon and transmon is just um, is just phase is, is phase oscillations phase oscillations near stable value so basically it's a regime where where nothing really hops but um, uh, there is some vibrational mode in the Jodeson potential. And um, I know, uh, so this will be a 2EJ. And so um, you can say that, well, because charge and flux are related, you know, by, you know, they're kind of dual to each other, right? There has to be some, some other qubit that is what fluxonium turns into um, something analogous to a transmon, right? And, and then if we, and this is exactly going to be the regime where uh, if you take EL much less than uh, uh, EC, which you have to take comparable to EJ in fluxonium, uh, that's what happens when you get a qubit that is um, a dual to transmon in the following sense. So I have uh, just a few minutes, I'm going to show it. Um, so you see, um, so, so you have a periodic potential like this, and when inductive shunt is very, very large, it's not that, it's actually, it's, it's almost as if it's not there. 
So it's going to be like this. And so then as a result, the potential energy becomes like a, uh, like a crystal, but with a little bit of, um, of, a, of, a, of a parabola on top. And what that does is um, it, um, it makes, um, like the way to think about it is that now um, you can consider hopping of flux not only between the two wells, but between, between many wells. Uh, and that leads to um, a formation of a kind of a block band. in phase. Uh, and so there has to be some states of a qubit and then that block band. Um, again, the beautiful thing about all these circuits is that it's actually one circuit, but just with different values of EJC and L, so you can just simulate it directly. And um, you, can, you, can, um, you can also consider this Hamiltonian. Take it and copy paste. So you see, um, I've um, I've told you that this operator here can be taken as um, E S cosine. Uh, something, well, let's call it Q. Um, and just to be consistent, I'm going to divide it by 2e and multiply by 2 pi. And this uh, Q, you see, it has a property that uh, you see e to the iq shifts uh, phi uh, by 2 pi. So what kind of operator is it? Well, uh, because of phase can shift charge, charge can shift phase. And, um, and this operator was actually introduced as a quasi-charge. Quasi-charge, I'll explain why it's a quasi-charge, if I'll try. It was actually introduced by um, um, Zorin, um, Averin, and uh, Elikharev. Um, uh, I think uh, at around uh, 1983. Um, the year I was born. And um, so way before the qubits era. Uh, and it turns out that they came up with, um, with the, you know, with a phenomena that was um, one of the hardest one to observe um, experimentally, uh, this kind of quantum dynamics of quasi-charge because it requires, um, you know, very large inductance to, to, to kind of enter this regime. Um, but you see, if we now uh, use this um, analogy, we can now draw. Um, so quasi-charge basically is, is an equally correct description of Josephson junctions as phase, but it's the dual one. And in quasi-charge, um, we get a potential very similar to the Josephson potential. So you see now it's just a cosine. And then when, when this um, hopping amplitude is very large compared to EL, we, we localize quasi-charge and it will just vibrate um, at the bottom of this, um, of this um, quasi-charge potential, which is actually uh, uh, is usually called block band. Um, and so you see uh, what happens is that when this happens, just think duality, uh, the spectrum is no longer sensitive to external uh, flux. So we get a spectrum of a loop that is interrupted by a junction and there is some external flux, but the spectrum is insensitive to um, spectrum insensitive to external flux. Um, and so you see, uh, in conclusion, um, we have these four qubits. Basically, we have an island, island, and we have a loop, 
and each has two regimes of motion. So, so for island, we have a Cooper pair box and a transmon. And for loop, we have um, a fluxonium. And we have uh, this, uh, this um, transmon regime of fluxonium, which we call blochnium. Um, so, um, and so you see there are, um, there are four, um, there are four of them. And so I hope I, um, I have given you, um, uh, I have given you some kind of idea of uh, how to classify um, these circuits. And um, so using these circuits, you basically can uh, create um, pretty much anything you want. So, so transmon, fluxonium, and blochnium are more practical than um, a Cooper per box because they're insensitive to charge offsets. So you can actually do, you know, some stuff with them. Um, and well, um, yeah, I guess that's all I actually uh, managed to um, explain <laughs> in my time. Um, so I'm happy to take uh, questions. Well, uh, well, thanks a lot for uh, this very didactic presentation. I think it's it makes um, often uh, much more effect than uh, you know just uh, showing uh, glancy slides and uh, a lot of information. Uh, I'm confident that uh, uh, there are certainly people in the audience which really learned uh, a lot with your lecture. Thanks. Um, thanks. That's really nice. Um, there were a couple of questions in the last uh, couple of minutes. Uh, I'm not sure from which point you answered some of them in the in the in the chat back. Maybe. Yeah, I can. Um, I think I can. Um, I mean, I see them. If you want, I can try to answer them. Um, uh, sort of in the in the order new to old. Um, I think maybe it's easier. Maybe you could just briefly uh, read uh, the the question and then answer. Right. I'm not sure. That right. So, yeah. so there is a question. Um, is there also an unharmonicity trade off going from fluxonium to blochnium? Yes, absolutely. Uh, it's exactly the same uh, trade-off, um, but there is one uh, practical. Um, there is one uh, practical uh, difference. So in uh, transmon, the trade-off is defined by the charge noise. Essentially, you have to you have to make uh, the unharmonicity sufficiently low such that the qubit transition gets um, a broadening of by the charge noise that gives you whatever t2 you want pre prefer presumably as much as, as, as you know uh, as possible let's say let's say a millisecond these days um and um and um in case of block gnome actually because flux noise is much um, smaller you can afford much bigger harmonicity and so um and so that that helps like if, if you want the typical spectrum of block gnome as a function of phi external can look like this. So the zero one transition can look like some, you know, can can be can be quite um, quite flat. That you know, let's say you won't really notice on the picture. But the second excited state can can already look a little bit like this. In case of transmons, um, so this is for uh, blochnion, and you see um, you can get a, a noticeable and harmonicity. Um, for block new. but in case of transmons, uh, because again, because charge noise is high, you can do that, um, and so so you're more limited. Um, oh yeah, there's a new question: Is block new sensitive to AC charge? Um, uh, yeah, AC charge is is basically nothing else but um, but um, but just regular um, re regular relaxation. Like essentially, it will um, it will introduce um, Mm, okay, depending what you see, what you mean. I mean, okay, if 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 you if you fluct if you vary the gate charge, if, if you mean by AC by AC charge, if you mean that you vary it sort of at a frequency much lower than the, the qubit frequency, then um, there is a paper uh, in the physical review letters by uh, Koch by Jens Koch, uh, uh, two thousand and nine. 
um, where the sensitivity to AC charge is calculated. And it turns out that this sensitivity, d omega zero one over d, uh, so to say, ng AC scales as, um, uh, it's kind of funny, it, it actually, um, one second, um, let me, let me tell you exactly what I want to say. Um, it's like this. It's like the, the effective spectral density of the derivative of the gate charge, like this, scales as d omega zero one over d phi external. Um, I'm not sure I can prove it on the spot, but uh, it's actually just a couple of lines. And so what happens is that because the, the qubit frequency is insensitive to flux, it is also um, protected from AC offset charge. So in some sense, fluxonium is more sensitive to AC charge than, than blochnium. And I'll have to think um, how to explain it qualitatively, but uh, yeah, that's where it, this question is answered. So let's see. So going uh, back um, in quantum optics, when phase is considered as an operator, the issue comes with a Hermitian property of the phase operator. How critical is this in superdotting qubits? Oh, that's an excellent question. I've um, um, uh, so this is how how this issue is taken care of. So you basically need to uh, so 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 in quantum optics, um, phase is. Um, is indeed an operator that's defined as an angle from zero to two pi. And hence, uh, you can only have an operator like, like basically phi is not an operator, is it, not, it's not a good operator. Uh, you have to use operators like e to the i phi. And uh, for example, you see we like uh, ej uh, cos phi, you see that's the good uh, Hermitian energy operator, um, but phi is not. However, uh, uh, whether phi is an angle or uh, a position of a particle on a real axis is determined by the circuit. And so in case of uh, the loop devices, uh, phi is actually a particle. So it's okay to have an operator like EL phi square over two, it's totally Hermitian. Um, but in case of an island, uh, it's not, and so 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 then it has to be e to the i phi. So that's uh, that's basically the, the the explanation. If you want, you cannot write Heisenberg uncertainty relation as delta phi delta n of order one for Cooper per box. Um, this is strictly speaking wrong. You you really should. Um, well, okay, maybe maybe I shouldn't say it like this, um, especially since you're recording this, then people will laugh at me. Uh, it's not correct to say that phi m uh, is uh, i. So uh, not for Cooper per box. For Cooper per box, you have to say that um, e to the i phi n e to the minus i phi is uh, n minus one. So that's correct. And that satisfies all the Hermitian um, things. So let's see. Um, Next question, two level state defects are insignificant question. Um, I think two level state defects are significant uh, <laughs> no matter what, because, because if uh, basically two level state defect, it's like, a, it's like a dipole, right? So as long as your qubit couples to a dipole, um, you, um, you know, it will be significant. And you might think that if you short circuit um, an island, to ground with an inductance, if you have here a dipole, uh, it's not going to be significant, but it will be because a short circuit is only at zero, at zero frequency, but at the finite frequency, you're going to get some coupling of whatever transition. Basically, when this circuit undergoes some transition, it does generate electric field, AC electric field. And this AC electric field will couple to a dipole. And then you have to look in more detail of um, how this coupling works. So the one thing I can tell you is like the way fluxonium evades this two level uh, defects is that 
if you operate at a low frequency, then the coupling actually drops quite significantly. In fact, you can argue that the coupling to dipole scales as omega squared, if I remember correctly. So when you reduce the frequency by a factor of 10, you kind of uh, get a pretty significant um, win um, in this um, coupling. So that's, um, um, that's, that's one of our tricks. Why the charge noise is very bad, but flux noise is okay. Um, a great question. I mean, it's a little bit like asking nature why it is like that. So um, uh, I don't really have actually an explanation. I, I don't think people know why flux noise is what it is. Actually, I don't. I don't think it's a solved uh, uh, question. But uh, but okay, maybe 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 there is some fundamentals to this. I mean, essentially. It's maybe it's related to the smallness of fine structure constant because you see the way charge noise is created that's basically charge it's electric field right so if you have charged dipoles um, their fluctuations create an um, electric field that couples to your system to get flux noise flux noise is created uh, because of fluctuations of magnetic impurities and usually magnetic couplings are weaker than electric coupling so maybe that's the ultimate reason, but I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't, yeah, I wouldn't insist on that. Okay, next question. Aren't low qubit frequency a problem due to thermal excitations? Um, surprisingly not, because, um, and the way to convince yourself is um, just think of some other uh, discipline like atomic physics. So atomic clock, um, it operates at a typical frequency of 10 gigahertz, but it operates at room temperature. And you know it's one of the most, it's probably the most coherent um, system in the world. So you see the short answer is no, it's, it's not. But of course you have to be clever about it. Um, what is the major decoherence source for fluxonium? Um, in my experience, it is, um, it is actually still dielectric loss. <laughs> Um, because the circuit still has some leads and um, these leads are covered by you know, layers of dielectrics. So um, if you ask me, how can we make fluxoniums better? I would say if we find a way to reduce this, um, uh, this, this dielectric loss in the circuit layers, I, I think their T1s will go up. And as for T2s, in properly filled experiments, they tend to be limited by T1. Um, uh, so um, that's, I think, the story. So it's actually pretty, pretty boring. <laughs> and the last question I didn't answer, do we need to replace C with C plus CG in the energy term while I introduce the gate voltage? Absolutely. Um, I was just a little sloppy, um, assuming that CG is much less than C. All right. Um, I think I went through all the questions. <laughs> yeah, that's also pointed out to me. Thanks a lot, Lot. Uh, can I have a short question from, from my side? Uh, uh, so I, I like your periodic table a lot. And I wonder uh, you know, what you think about uh, really um, the future of block neum in the um, circuit elements, which really win uh, attention in practical circuits. And what prevents um, block neum being sort of uh, the favorite qubit uh, um, um, of the day, uh, will it take time, or are there fundamental reasons uh, to expect that it's not going to happen anywhere near in the future? Um, well, I think it just takes time. Like every time you introduce a new circuit, you need to understand. It's very hard to figure out um, how good or how bad a circuit is from theoretical considerations, because in practice. For example, what's really important is how well the circuit cools down in your fridge. And we don't really understand this process, right? Because at low temperatures, things are not even supposed to cool down. So all our circuits cool down in some ways that is a little bit unclear to us. And whenever you make a new circuit, it, this can happen to it very, very differently. So I think it will take some time to kind of gain some understanding of that. Um, so I would say that the more people work with this circuit, the faster we will find out uh, if it's useful or not. Um, the practical issue is that it requires this really large inductors, which you can make, but 
if you make them with mistakes, um, it will cause problems. And I meant to actually talk about this, but I'm a little bit um, overestimated my uh, handwriting speed. Uh, maybe I can comment on this uh, in brief. So essentially what happens is that if you deviate from an ideal inductance circuit, you will introduce some parasitic resonances in this uh, system. And a parasitic resonance, you can always think of it theoretically as some mode that is coupled to an ideal circuit. And unfortunately, the way large inductance break down is uh, they break down because this parasitic mode couples very strongly to the circuit. And as a result, it, well, if you really scrap, it will just modify your spectrum. Um, and if you just have this mode um, in your system, let's say above the qubit frequency, and you would think it's not important, but it's it actually is because you will get that mode. And if that mode, let's say, doesn't cool down, it will uh, deface um, your qubit. Uh, but it all boils down to uh, reducing the stray capacitance, isn't it? Uh, yeah, yeah, but uh, kind of reducing it by a lot. <laughs> yeah. um, and I think uh, it's, there might be some fundamental uh, limit where you cannot really I go uh, beyond with the usual means, right? So there will be always this, this issue that you have this parasitic modes. There is that, yes, but, uh, but also the quality of the stray capacitance is important. For example, if it has some dielectric loss, it will load your stray mode. And uh, even if the coupling to the main qubit is weak, mm -hmm. you will get some effective kind of like a Purcell effect. Uh, so you see, it's important basically how lossy is your stray capacitance. And then the second question is, even if it's not that lossy, what's important is how well does that mode cool down? Because if it cools down, then it's not really going to bother the qubit. But if there is, let's say, you know, a 0.01 of a thermal photon, that might actually limit the coherence time. And I think that is probably the most uh, practical issue of any complex superconducting circuit because if you can't control these modes you definitely can control their populations and um, the coherence then really you know uh, is like the more these modes you couple to um, the more dangerous it is so that's really the problem with working with more complex uh, circuits so i but fundamentally we you know you got to be able to um, take it under control. So I'm, I, I think it's, uh, um, I, I think, um, I think it's a promising qubit. It just, um, you know, transmon, I, I, by the way, to this questions, I usually remind everyone that um, first transmons didn't really work better than a Cooper per box. Um, uh, so Cooper per box uh, had T1s of a few microseconds, T2s, um, I think maybe up to a microsecond, but the uh, first uh, transmons had T1s of um, 100, 100 nanosecond. Um, and uh, in a few years of research, intensive research, it was found out that, well, okay, there's, they're, they're coupled stronger to the other circuit mode. So you get per cell effect, you have to be very, very careful about it. Uh, one of the practical aspects of this is that try to find a transmon that operates well above the cavity frequency. You won't. It has to be below. And that's one thing that was kind of, you know, discovered. Uh, so I think with any new circuit, and transmons are pretty simple circuits. So with these new circuits, you just have to kind of try things around until, you know, before you find out uh, how to properly operate it. Great, thanks a lot. Uh, there is a very last question. I think we really need to round up. We are um, out of time. Um, from Evgeny Polakov on the chat about cooling down the circuits. Um, I, I can't read the question, sorry. <laughs> uh, it, it's below, so um, uh, where can we read about cooling down the circuits? <laughs> um, the answer is nowhere. Um, in fact, uh, in fact, um, if you, um, if you, um, if you, you know, um, if you somehow, if somehow all the group leaders of superconducting cubes, and you know, I don't know, uh, fifty of them disappear, um, the progress in the field will be down by fifty years because uh, <laughs> there are a lot of things that are just not written. And um, sometimes I refuse to write them because I'm not sure. Like, you know, people ask me, well, how, how do you cool down your circuit? And I say, well, I'm not sure I can actually write this down because probably if I do, 
I will miss something or I will emphasize something that's not really important. It's, uh, it's just that uh, we don't really understand um, thermalization of circuits that well. Um, sometimes, um, like what really, some basically we're lucky if we follow some procedure and we can reproduce it and then it works in one group just because we keep doing a bunch of things the same without even realizing exactly what are those things. And when you try to repeat it in some other groups there, the conditions are a little different and that thing all of a sudden doesn't work. Like the best example is I think it was this um, ECASOR filters, right? Different groups use them in a different way. And, and uh, you know, uh, in some group it works and some group it works different. Other groups will say, I don't even need that filter. So, so you see uh, that's the beauty of our field. That's precisely why a big industrial company cannot build a working quantum computer quite yet. Um, uh, because a lot of uh, things that remain unknown and hence there is a lot of a job for next generation, you know, students and scientists to actually figure out. So take my uh, negative uh, uh, answer to your question as an invitation to actually write a book uh, yourself on uh, how to cool down circuits. It will be a very popular book. <laughs> Thank you. This is uh, very motivating. Thanks a lot. I guess we need to, uh, to round up and uh, thank Vlad for this very uh, lively uh, interactive uh, lecture. I think it was very, very useful and interesting for everyone. Thank you very much for taking time to, to give this Take presentation. Take care. Bye-bye.